Well, it's really my pleasure to welcome Beth back to Tufts. Uh, I've been a volunteer now for a number of years, counting heron that run the Mystic River and then jump up to the upper uh, Mystic Lake. And that has been really, it's been a really fun sort of community building exercise. And I got to know her because she has been such an important sort of person in organizing these things. And then she, I got roped in to start pulling um, um, water chestnuts. And so there's what, what's really kind of cool, and I think this picture really captures it, is that there's a whole community of people that are involved in the Mystic River in many different ways, shapes, and forms. And Beth is the has been really a critical piece of that. She graduated from Tufts in 2003 with an environmental studies degree along with anthropology. So um, that was well before my time as taking over as director, but um, it's really great to have someone come back. So I'm looking forward to hearing about all the many exciting things. Students have been volunteering, interning, at the uh, Mystic River Watershed Association for quite a number of years, and so we hope to sort of see more students getting involved in the future. I think that's on right. All right, well, thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here, though it's good to be back on campus. Um, and as was mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the Mystic River Watershed Association, where I've been working for the last five years, um, and particularly focusing on volunteerism on this urban river. And I want to start by asking, who has volunteered for any organization? Show of hands. Almost everybody. Not surprising, TAPS has a really strong community service program, which I think is, is great. Um, has anyone volunteered for the Watershed Association? Okay, even more of you, that's great. Welcome, thanks for coming, good to see you. Um, does anyone have a volunteer story they would like to share, either a good one or maybe a not so good one, <laughs> what went wrong at that opportunity? I find it's always fun for me to hear these stories since I manage a lot of our volunteer programs. Wow. And the fish just went all the way through. I don't know what happened, but that was pretty crazy. You couldn't click fast enough. <laughs> Great. Any other stories to share? Well, if we have time, we can always circle back to, to that as well. Oh, yep. Great. That's always wonderful to hear. So I'm hoping to provide you with an overview of the Mystic River watershed um, and also the volunteer opportunities that we have, sort of framing it in terms of most of you being undergraduate students, I'm assuming. Uh, I think that volunteering is a great opportunity, not only for you to grow your resume, um, but to find out kind of what you want to do and what you don't want to do. Uh, I was thinking about that a little bit on my way over here and sort of a more personal story in, in my graduate studies. Uh, I was focusing in environmental education and I went into this program thinking, oh, I'm going to work with kids, it's going to be great. And then I took an internship working with kids and it wasn't so great <laughs> and I realized I love kids and I'm happy to work with them sometimes, but not all the time. And so that was a really valuable experience for me and really drastically changed the rest of my um, career. So I encourage you to get involved. These opportunities are here for you to explore. And there are so many nonprofits um, in the Boston area. So you've got lots of opportunities. And of course, you know, not just the nonprofit sector, but just lots of, of great opportunities in this area. And I think Tufts is a really strong uh, program to get you guys hooked up. Um, with these various organizations and corporations. So a little bit about us. Oh, before I wanted to start with Tufts. So when I went here, I'll admit I'm not the best with my sense of geography. Uh, I've never been been great, so I love my, my smartphone now. But I wasn't too sure where the river was, even though I volunteered for the Mystic River. 
And it's very close to campus, as it turns out. So I hope that you do get a chance to go explore. It's right near the Whole Foods that some of you may frequent. Uh, Tufts also has the new, brand new sailing team uh, boathouse up on the upper lake. And then this other star along the Malden River is where the crew team practices out of. And again, another uh, gorgeous building and wonderful resources for you to, to go check out. So I do hope you'll engage in the river uh, the rest of your time here at Tufts because it is a great great resource for you, a great place to go walk and explore and, and maybe um, volunteer with us and, and get your feet wet. So I thought I would start today with an exploration of the watershed because that really frames the work that I do and how we target uh, various audiences and the messaging and that sort of thing. Um, and then talk about what the association does and how we utilize volunteers to really accomplish a lot of work. It's really quite impressive. And I think that's one of the unique things about this uh, association is just how much we rely upon volunteer efforts. And I wanted to start really basic understanding of what our watershed is. So I attend a lot of community events, and still this is the most common question I get from folks is just, what is a watershed? So a very basic refresher. Uh, it's a land area that's connected essentially by the water that flows over this land. I like to think of it like a big cup. You can imagine all the rainwater and snow melt in that cup, eventually makes its way down to the bottom of the cup, and then in this case, it pours out into the Boston Harbor. So again, all that land and all that water is connected. So wherever you are in the world, you're in a watershed. So right now, you happen to be in the Mystic. You can imagine the boundaries being higher points in elevation. Um, it's hard to imagine mountains in this area, but there are certainly hills. We're on one right now. <laughs> so here is the Mystic River watershed. Uh, it's bits and pieces of 22 communities in the greater Boston area. You can see it's a very urban watershed, uh, so we do have some unique challenges. And we often refer to it as the upper watershed or the upper mystic and then the lower mystic. And what separates these two is the dam, the Amelia Earhart Dam, which is near Assembly Row in Somerville, which you may be familiar with. There's a brand new outlet mall and um, movie theater and that sort of thing in this vicinity. And so the portion below the dam is tidal. Historically, the river would have been tidal all the way up to the Mystic Lakes, but that dam was installed in the 1960s and prevents the flow of the, the salt water any further. So it's very different ecosystems as well and unique sets of um, problems. So above the Mystic, or above, excuse me, in the upper Mystic, above the dam, that's all the fresh water. They also look a little bit different. Now both are urban. But typically in the upper Mystic, there is more green space. Uh, it's a little bit more residential. Where the lower Mystic, we have a lot more industry and a lot more pavement that comes with that, that industry. So the Mystic is still very much a hardworking river and had a big role in the development of the local economy. So this is a picture, aerial uh, view of, oops, of a section of Medford, actually. Just to give you a sense of, there is some green space here along the river, but there's also a lot of impervious surface, a surface where rainwater and so forth can't get to the river. This is very common in urban watersheds, but this can cause a lot of pollution issues. So there's a lot of stormwater runoff um, from all of these impervious surfaces that's picking up pollutants along the way and adding nutrients to the river, which in excess is a bad thing also adding bacteria and so forth. This is the lower mystic, and I think it's kind of hard to see in this light, but um, you can see there's a lot of gray areas. So this is all development in here. And again, a point of reference, this would be Route 16. Here's the Gateway Plaza with Target brilliantly putting their Target logo on their roof. <laughs> Uh, so the Mystic River and Chelsea Creek. So this would be the saltwater section uh, of the river and just very industrialized. Um, some of the industries along the river's banks include some steel recycling facilities as well as LNG tankers that come through. And does anyone have an idea what this big white pile is? Salt. Yes, it is salt. So that's along Chelsea Creek, which is saltwater anyway. Um, but you can imagine 
a lot of salt that in this particular photograph is not covered. In the next photograph, you'll see it is covered, and that's what this noxious tricolored blob is. <laughs> that's a big salt pile, but I think really gives, gives it a sense of scale, just how much salt that is. Um, so there's a lot of really important industry that's being shipped in, and it needs to go somewhere. Um, but an interesting point to think about is that access to the river and how that impacts people's appreciation of these waterways. So again, we're looking at Chelsea and East Boston. This is where most of those people live. So you can see they don't have much access to the river. They're not really living super close because all of this is industry and private property and they only have this little bit of green space. So I just wanted to throw this in to kind of frame some of the challenges of, of my role is um, getting people to the river, which can literally be have a barrier, and getting them to appreciate something that they can't even access, and maybe they don't want to access. So some of the environmental hazards in the watershed include some toxic, toxic waste sites, transfer stations, incinerators, uh, we have overflows, and we just have a lot of industrial facilities, again, particularly in the lower portion of the watershed, but, but historically, you know, up uh, in the freshwater section as well. I have a quick little video for you to show you this set of more slides, thought why not show so hopefully this will work. Only three minutes. This is the Lower Mystic Lake. The dam was under construction. Okay. So that was a very quick tour of the river, and it was the time lapse photography. So I hope. I don't know if you got dizzy while watching that. It isn't uh, the smoothest ride and gotten that feedback <laughs> before. Should have mentioned that prior because you guys are all eating. <laughs> uh, 
so that's sort of a sense of the river. So you can see there was this more industrial section, and then it, it really opened up and had a lot more green space along the banks and had this beautiful, um, very picturesque lake, um, at the, which is at the top of the Mystic River, essentially. So I wanted, just in case you hadn't gone out on the river yourself, there was a quick little tour for you. Uh, I also wanted to mention that there are diverse stakeholders in the watershed, and, and this is just a segment of the entire watershed, uh, talking about environmental justice populations. So the colors are various uh, designations, if they're minority residents, if they're minority and low income, if they're foreign born, this sort of thing. So you don't necessarily need to know what these colors mean, uh, just there are lots of different types of populations. and thinking about how to engage people in our work. This is one of the challenges that we have is when, you know, we really speak English very well, so that's a challenge in and of itself. And then just to recognize that folks have a lot of different pressures on them and different, um, you know, priorities in their lives and that volunteering to help their local river may not be one of them. Um, and that's okay. So the question becomes, how do we protect this urban river, right? We know some of the challenges, both in terms of the people that live here and their limited access, as well as uh, some of the environmental considerations that we have. And that's where the Watershed Association comes in. So we have been working to protect and restore the Mystic River, its tributaries, and watershed lands for more than 40 years. We currently have a staff of five which is the largest in our history. Uh, we used to just have like a part-time executive director. So we really rely on uh, volunteers historically to get our, our work done and we continue that today. And as I mentioned, I think that's, um, for me in part because it's my, my job, but I really love that aspect of the association. I think it's one of its great strengths is that we're able to engage people in our work. And we work on the entire watershed scale. So that's also, um, somewhat unique for some of the other environmental groups that we partner with. They may only work in, in Chelsea, as an example. So as part of our, our mission, we kind of come at it in three ways to, again, protect and restore the entire um, river and watershed lands. So our, our primary avenue is through this scientific assessment. We have uh, three different water quality monitoring programs that we maintain. We also do invasive species removal. Uh, we also have another sort of leg is our, our policy and advocacy leg where we would submit comment letters on different development proposals and that sort of thing as they uh, bubble up. Um, the latest examples, we've been working with the, the Wynn Resorts Casino um, development that was proposed and now um, going forward uh, to modify their plans to have more of a, a living shoreline approach um, that the casino site is right on the banks of the Mystic River and originally in, in their original plan they had sort of like a hard edge of riprap along the shoreline and we said hey you know maybe you could try to restore some salt marsh right there and have a, a more of a buffer area and do some restoration work so um, we were fortunate that they did modify their plans to be more environmentally sensitive and actually increase the size of the park space um, as part of that plan as well. We'll see what happens, but that's, that's the latest. Uh, and then what I do is largely the education and outreach. So I work with the public, but also with the municipal staff and municipal leaders to educate them about issues um, throughout the watershed and then how they can help and get involved. So with like a municipal example, they might be able to implement green infrastructure which is, could be like a rain garden or a bioswale, that sort of thing, to treat stormwater runoff, um, which, as I mentioned before, is a big issue for us in such an urban area. So, as I mentioned a couple times now, we really do a lot of our work through volunteerism. I was trying to think of a program that we have that doesn't use volunteers. And that was a challenge for me. <laughs> I don't know that I've really come up with one. There are certain examples, I'm like, well, you know, the, the fundraising letters, I, I usually do that myself. You know, I don't usually get volunteers, but that's like such a specific thing. So we really do use volunteers for so many different things. And uh, I think that's a, just a fun way to get involved with local organizations. So to start with, our, our foundation is really our water quality monitoring data that informs our advocacy as well as our outreach. Um, so these red dots on the map are our 15 
uh, baseline monitoring sites. So those sites are sampled monthly between 6 and 8 a.m. by volunteers. These volunteers are trained uh, and they go in pairs together to a site. So we've got about 40 or so trained citizen scientists that participate in this program. This has been ongoing since 2000. All of our data is available publicly online. You can explore that, use that for some of your, your projects if you'd like. So generally these are folks from throughout the watershed uh, and they receive a three hour or so training and then they shadow existing monitors at a site before they can become uh, a, a water quality monitor with us. We have a strict protocol that we need to follow with this training for this particular program uh, to be in compliance with the EPA because they use our data as well. And we try to do our best to uh, celebrate our, our monitors and our volunteers. So uh, these five folks received a, a Myra vest and that's because they we're celebrating their 10-year anniversary of being involved with the baseline monitoring program. I wanted to mention that not all of our monitors are men. <laughs> um, we do have female monitors, but this particular year we had a whole bunch of men that received uh, the award, which is just really great. So these, some of these people also, I'll just mention, they're, they're a funny group. You know, they're volunteering between 6 and 8 in the morning, but they are so dedicated to that site. I mean, they'll go out in any conditions and they're not gonna let anyone, a new volunteer in. They are like, that's my site. They're really possessive over it. Um, so it's really great to see, it's, it's fun. And it's great to get to know these folks because you're working with them uh, every month for years and years. Our other program that came up already, I wanted to mention was our herring monitoring program. So historically, uh, we had a bucket brigade. So the end of the video at the Mystic Lakes, there was the dam that was under construction that I mentioned briefly. And now there's a fish ladder, so the fish can go up on their, their own. But prior to that, they'd hit the dam and wouldn't be able to get through. And so prior to my time with the association, we used to hold what was called a bucket brigade. And it'd be a couple Saturdays in May, and we would hope the fish would be there. And we get a group of volunteers together in a bunch of uh, five-gallon buckets and nets. And we would literally take them from the Lower Mystic Lake, hoist them over the dam and dump them out and count them along the way. And so we were moving thousands and thousands of fish. And you may know that the herring are, are like the salmon um, and they live in the ocean and then migrate to fresh water to spawn or, or lay their eggs. And a lot of times they go back to that same spawning area. So they kept coming back and back and back and eventually we were able to retrofit the, the dam with this fish ladder so now they can go whatever, it could be a Sunday, not a Saturday, they can go whenever they want. <laughs> so this program started in 2012, and we had volunteers this year uh, count over 31,000 herring between April 1st and say mid-June. Um, we have about 100 herring monitors that perform this counting. It's 10 minute slots and we have 12 slots a day. And when this program first started, I was really worried. I was like, who the heck is gonna wanna count fish? This sounds really boring. You know, you're standing out on the dam, you're just looking down and counting fish. Well, I don't know what it is about this program and about fish, but I don't ever, knock on wood, uh, need to worry. Uh, these people keep coming back. They're, they're old people, they're young people, they're families, they're students. Um, people are really excited to see the fish. And I think part of that is, you know, we do a lot of work with water quality, which you can't really see. But the fish, it's really, it really is exciting to see them when they're there and they can come at just these huge spurts. Uh, so it's really, it's sort of a magical thing to witness. This is an example of where you sit or um, some people lay down on this grate on the dam and look. And so there's actually a whiteboard that we've installed um, at the fish ladder. So there's some contrast, because it's hard to see fish uh, without that contrast. So this little thing here, <laughs> That's a, that's a herring coming out, so this guy's counting. Um, so we share this data with the State Division of Marine Fisheries, and they put it into a model that they have created for herring runs throughout the, the state. Um, and they actually estimate about 240,000 herring made their way through this fish ladder up into the upper Mystic Lake, which is a really strong run. And 
somewhat of an indicator of the health of the, the Mystic River, which I think a lot of people may have an impression that ooh, the Mystic is in kind of rough shape. Right? We had the, Mis the Mystic River movie um, that didn't help us out too much for, in terms of our reputation. It's a great film, but... <laughs> So this is just a reassuring thing that folks can do, and I think it really is fun. It's also only from April to June, and you only need to do it for 10 minutes a week. So it's a short time commitment as well. Uh, as also was mentioned with some of our restoration work, our, our primary program in terms of restoration on the river is invasive species removal, and particularly the water chestnut, which is of uh, Asian descent and this program began in 2010, and it's our largest volunteer base, and we've really been ramping up over the last few years. These plants are, are pretty crazy. Uh, they, the seeds, each plant can produce, say, a dozen seeds. Those seeds can lay at the bottom of the river and be viable for 10 years or so. Uh, so it's definitely a long-term management approach, and we have seen some success just in the last few years of our, our efforts have, have paid off. Um, but the primary way we remove water chestnuts is with volunteers. Um, so we get groups from the community out on the weekends to help us for a few hours. We provide canoes and snacks and life jackets and all of that and orientation. Get them out to pull this invasive plant from the river for a few hours. We also have really been ramping up our corporate program. So this top photo, I don't remember what corporation this is, but we've worked with IBM and Google and other companies to get them out during the week as part of a team building and community service opportunity where they'll come and oftentimes these, these groups can be anywhere from 10 people to, I think this one was probably close to 100, um, and they'll come out for the day. So that really got our numbers up. And we were able to uh, hire two interns to help with that work last summer and we'll likely be doing that again. And we did have a tough intern doing that last last summer, who was fantastic. So just some of the successes from this year. Actually, the, the tough woman I'm talking about made this. So we had 19 events, and that uh, brought in over 940 volunteers. We removed over 6,600 baskets. So we used these um, kind of, you can see it here, these laundry baskets like up here. We actually fill with this plant by hand. Um, and that equates to uh, about 132,000 pounds of invasive plant that was removed from the river, or about 2.3 miles of the river that was cleared. So this year we think we uh, removed about 90% of what was present at the beginning of this season. So uh, it was definitely pretty successful. We also have a mechanical harvester is a machine that is out there and um, in some ways much more efficient on those large patches that was working away. So not all of this was just through um, volunteers, but certainly we've had a lot of help, many helping hands. Um, so you can see this program again, as I mentioned, we're really ramping it up. And a lot of that is the increase in the corporate events that we had this year. So engaged quite a few more people in 2014 than in the past. Um, so this program runs June, July, and August, if you are around. It is a fun way to get on the river. You're going to get wet and you're going to get dirty, but it, it is, I, I find it to be really rewarding, but I still don't mind getting dirty. So <laughs> uh, to put that in a slightly different perspective, in terms of volunteer hours, it was just under 4,000 hours. Um, and we were concentrating again in, in Medford and Somerville. It was pretty remarkable to think about, gosh, almost 4,000 volunteer hours in just two or three months on the Mystic River for this particular project. Uh, it's nice to have these sort of metrics as we move forward with this program. Some of the other types of, of work we do um, are outreach events. So we host an Earth Day River cleanup every April, get anywhere from 50 to 150 people to help literally just pick up trash. Um, and even in the wet, cold conditions that we had last April for the event, I also am able to recruit volunteers to attend different fairs and festivals throughout the watershed. I don't want to work every Saturday, and I can't be in 22 communities at once, so it's great to have volunteers that like to sit at a table and um, talk to passerbyers about what we do and get them engaged in our work. Uh, lastly, we have our annual herring run and paddle, which unfortunately always is a day of 
Pep's uh, graduation and every other college graduation, but the weekend before is Mother's Day and the weekend after is Memorial Day, so kind of caught there. But it'd be great if you feel like coming and are able to. Uh, it's May 17th, 2015. So this is our signature event and fundraiser for the association. Uh, and it has also really ramped up in the last several years. And a lot of that's due to volunteers. So all of these folks registering people for the race are volunteering. We have volunteers who hand out the t-shirts and hand out the, the drinks and the bananas and all of that sort of stuff. And they're out on the course. Um, it's a 5K road race and then a three, a nine, or a 12 mile paddling race. Um, and in the last five years, our numbers have just about doubled. We had over 700 people participate uh, last May. So we're hoping to keep that trajectory up and continue to engage people in the river and bringing them to the river. Finally, we have our committees, which we actually meet in this very room once a month, generally the first Tuesday of the month. We have currently have two committees. It does change occasionally, but we have a policy committee. Um, Rusty Russell from Tufts is a key member of that policy committee. Um, so they'll help write some of these comment letters um, about the different developments that are being proposed throughout the watershed as an example. Uh, then we also have the Clean Water Campaign Committee, which I am part of and is more of a educational and communications type campaign. And so we'll have different initiatives that we're working on. The committees work together for the first hour um, and oftentimes have a guest speaker to learn about an issue in more depth and then break up into our separate groups. But I'd say it's about 15 to 30 people who come regularly to those meetings. So it's another really strong base of volunteers. Historically, um, the committees were even stronger because we didn't have the staff to run, as an example, the herring run and paddle. So there would literally be volunteers running an event for several hundred people. And Top uh, was historically quite involved in that too. And we have wonderful interns. So our interns have a variety of projects that they work on from water quality monitoring to organizing the entire herring monitoring program to water chestnut to special projects to mapping with with GIS, um, it's helping us with database transitions, that sort of thing. So a lot of opportunity there. And uh, finally, we have a lot of special projects and grants. So depending on what the project is we're working on, we may be bringing on volunteers or interns to assist with that type of work. Um, this showing some pictures of a rain garden that we built. We built three, two in Arlington and one in Everett. And rain gardens are areas that treat stormwater runoff. So in this particular case, it's at an elementary school in Arlington. And the rainwater is coming off the parking lot and flowing over these little pebbles. We were having some erosion problems. So this was our makeshift. We, we tried it out. I don't know how well it worked, but to stop the erosion uh, issues we were having. Um, and so the, the rainwater flows off of the pavement and into the garden where it can be solely infiltrated and absorbed as opposed to just going into a storm drain where it's sent directly to the river without any sort of treatment. And throughout this particular project, we were able to engage the community. And we did that through various means. We had um, several meetings where we were just talked about the project and the community actually recommended sites for rain gardens throughout the, the town. So we had some maps of different sections of the town and we had them mark up locations where they thought it would be feasible to put a rain garden in based on some criteria that we presented. Um, then they actually helped design the garden. So what plants did they want in there? What did they want the overall like look and feel to be? Uh, and then finally they helped plant. So they like to get, to get dirty, <laughs> get their hands dirty. Um, and now they're helping to maintain it too. So. That's one of the, the challenges with this type of project is the maintenance, I find, um, and just keeping people engaged in that process. So uh, we really want to pass it off to the community after we build these sort of projects. And in some cases, we were able to do that. So that's a little bit, well, that's, that's a lot of our projects and programs that I just covered. We didn't overwhelm you. Um, so some of the takeaways and challenges I was thinking about in, in preparation for, for this is, again, I think we have that advantage that we're known in the community of having this really strong volunteer engagement 
component of our work, um, and we're able to engage volunteers to accomplish our mission. So you kind of learn the hard way, but when we take on volunteers uh, in our office now or interns, we make sure that the project they want to do actually helps us as well and helps them. We want it to have a mutual benefit. But uh, earlier on, you know, we were just excited by new, any new project that would come up and say, sure, go for it, and then realize, this doesn't really help us get where we want to be here, vice versa. So we really try to work together with people to make sure that it's mutually uh, beneficial, especially with our, our intern projects. Um, I found that having these really short, fun events keeps people engaged. You have free food. Uh, that's always great, too, and get people there. Uh, and then trying to thank our volunteers often and really make them feel appreciated. And that can be a challenge just because we have such a small staff that if we worked with, this year we probably worked with like 1,200 people. So to be able to actually say thank you to all those people um, is certainly a, a challenge of ours. Hi, right, come on in. Uh, and I really wanted to underline that we literally could not do this work and run our programs without our volunteers. You know, to count 31,000 fish was, I mean, that would just not have been possible without the help of our, our volunteers. Um, to remove over 6,000 baskets of water chestnuts, I mean, again, there's no way that five staff members could have done that, even if we were out all day, every day. Uh, so it really is just such a central part of our organization and part of our work. From my perspective, and, and coming at this from a slightly different angle with the messaging and, and the marketing, being the communications person in our office, uh, I think it's helpful to really be clear what you're asking for. So if you're expecting people to come for two hours or three hours, and in case of, say, water chestnut, you know, what to wear, um, that you're going to get wet and you're going to get, get dirty, and if there's a bathroom and where people can park. So just thinking about that as you take some projects or take some internships, um, that's always a good thing is to be really clear. And then just realizing that people have many, priorit many priorities. I, I mentioned this earlier, but you know, why should that particular person care about the river? People have different value systems and uh, just trying to reach people where they are. So some folks that we work with, their children are on a crew team on the Malden River. And that, for them, is their focus area is the Malden River and, and water quality. Whereas others, they love the wildlife. So if you think about that and trying to do your, your recruitment for these various programs, what's, what's going to hit home? Um, and think about where, sort of the same question but posed a different way, is how can you best reach people where they are? So I mentioned that Mystic doesn't always have the best reputation as being the healthiest river. Uh, the EPA gives us a report card, gives the river a report card. You can see here, since 2006, had a D, a few C minuses thrown in there. Uh, but overall, it's, it's not a great grade, right? This isn't really a report card you'd hang on your fridge and be really proud of. Um, and so people have this perception of the river as gross and dirty and just why would you even care to get involved to try to improve this? It's, it's not improving at all, as you can see, and, you know, it's a done deal. It's, it's a waste of time, right? We, we do run into this. But we are seeing slight improvements, and we we actually have some uh, challenges with the way the EPA constructs this grade. So the main stem of the Mystic River is actually pretty good most of the time for swimming and for boating. It meets water quality standards. The tributaries are another story. That's where a lot of our uh, issues are, and that's what brings down the grade. Grades also based on 12 samples from throughout the year, which is completely random and may not be representative of the whole story. So I think things are, just so you guys know, much better than a D, <laughs> and uh, they are really improving. Like I said, we've been seeing a lot of success, and it's just lots of small stories, but it's a river ecosystem, and it, it's just it's going to take a while to turn around. Uh, but we've seen it happen. The Charles River right next door, they have a B plus, I believe, this year. Um, and, you know, you look at their report, report card from a decade or two ago, and they were right there at a D as well. So we can see that transformation. It takes time, it takes resources, um, and it takes a movement, which is what we're, we're trying to start by really engaging more and more people, which is getting at the, the last point there is to inspire people to take further action. So maybe that would be contacting their legislators and other elected officials, 
to let folks know that, that the river is important to them and um, talking to municipal staff, say, hey, you know, why don't you put in porous pavement here to allow some of that water to be absorbed. Um, and then we're always encouraging them to get more involved with us as a, a member or a volunteer. And I mentioned this at the outset, but it's a great way to build your resume and get a feel for different sectors and for professions. So I hope that you do become a volunteer. Maybe not here. Maybe this isn't your thing, and that's fine. Um, but I think it is a great opportunity to, to give back and to learn something about yourself and um, meet some new friends and kind of get out of the college bubble as well. Um, so we, I really, for me, this is one of the my best, my favorite parts about my job is just getting to meet the many, many people that we work with and I find their stories about why they care and why they give their time and their energy really inspiring. And so despite sometimes feeling like another Saturday event, you know, I just want to sleep in or go away or whatever, it really, they're fun events. Uh, and again, it's, it is, it's a great way to get to know more of, of your own community, um, which for me is quite important. I think it will be for you as well. So any questions? about the Watershed Association or the Mystic in general. Thank you. Thank you. Great questions. So the first question was, uh, there's a movement across the country to dismantle dams, and is there any conversation about that along the Mystic? Uh, and no, there's not. So the Amelia Earhart Dam, uh, as I mentioned, was constructed in the 60s, but it, it's helping with um, flooding issues further upstream. They can lower the river before a big rainstorm, and I just don't I don't see the state moving in that direction to dismantle that one. Uh, that particular dam is a lock system, so it does open to allow boats through, and the dam operators also are very cognizant of the herring, which is kind of neat. So that's usually our first signal that they're coming is a phone call from uh, the folks at the dam and saying they're letting through the school of fish, uh, and they let us know they're coming. But as far as I know, there's not an effort to remove uh, the Amelia Earhart Dam. I think, again, especially with climate change, just a concern of, of flooding. Now, we have concerns with the dam, too, in terms of climate change, like, well, couldn't the ocean just come right over the dam? And it certainly could and may at some point. So that, that needs to be resolved still. Uh, and the second question was working with municipalities and how is our relationship there? I think it's good and bad. I think you know, some communities are more receptive than others. And it's just sort of case by case. We work with particular staff members and just try to find who uh, we get along with <laughs> and how we can, you know, work our way in to work with these communities. So generally, we try to be friendly in our approach. Um, we haven't taken, like, a legal stance against any of, of the communities uh, for some of our, our water quality findings. We alert them. We try to work with them to find solutions. So um, for some of our water quality <coughs> programs, we've, we identify pipes that are leaking sewage, as an example which is against the law and disgusting, right? You don't want sewage in your river. <laughs> um, and so we alert them and they have 30 days to respond. And then we um, share that information with the EPA or the, Depart the State Department of Environmental Protection. But generally we try very much to, to work collaboratively. Uh, more recently we've been working with uh, municipal staff on various grants. So as an example in Medford, since you mentioned you're from Medford, we're working with the uh, Office of Energy and Environment with Alicia Hunt there, and we are working on uh, designing some um, green infrastructure for that municipality and doing some code review as well um, to look at how they might be able to change their, their stormwater regulations. And then also within Medford at the same time as part of that grant, uh, helping them reach other deliverables for some of their stormwater permits through public education, that sort of thing. So we are sort of training staff in various communities through these grants 
on what is green infrastructure, what are the benefits, and where maybe they could put it. So we use GIS to look at where is a feasible location within the city that we're working in. Good question. Yes. 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 So that's a great question. So the question was, um, if you have any remote listeners, uh, the differences between the Malden River and the Mystic River for visible changes in, in conditions there. Uh, yes, the Malden River has a long history of industrial use, and so the uh, sediments there are in tough shape. They're pretty toxic. Um, there's a lot of heavy metals and that sort of thing that are still lingering in that sediment, and uh, eventually I think it will be dredged, but that costs a lot of money. So it's question of when that money will become available and who wants to foot that bill. Uh, so that is a big concern in the in the Malden River and why you don't see a lot of public access to the Malden River as well as those landowners are hesitant to put in a, a boat launch because you get your foot in the muck, what are you coming into contact with? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then I think you're right that there is this interest in cleaning up the main stem of the Mystic River with the area boat clubs and yacht clubs along the banks there. It's more visible. The Malden River is sort of hidden. Yeah. So there is a group working on that, uh, the Friends of the Malden River. There's even a Friends of the Mystic River that is different from our organization that we partner with. Uh, but the Friends of the Malden are trying to improve access to the river and improve the water quality. Uh, and that's a, a focus that this grant I was mentioning in Medford. Is, it's actually Medford, Malden, and Everett. So we're really focused on improving the health of the Malden River in particular. So hopefully we will see that. But it's interesting that you can note it this, yeah, visibly and with your nose, I'm sure, a little bit too. <laughs> Yes. I was impressed with how fast it's evolved. Yeah. And at a level that I was wondering, would that or could that have happened if it weren't for organization? So what mm. So the question is our role in a oil spill two years ago in Arlington. And uh, that was, our immediate response was almost luck that one of our members and volunteers happened to be on site in a vehicle when that tanker flipped and the oil, um, this home heating oil um, spilled. So he called us immediately, and we were, you know, we're based in Arlington Center, and this happened right between, along the Mystic River, right between um, Arlington and Medford. So it was a very quick drive, um, but we were really fortunate that he called us right away, because sometimes we're not the first ones to find out, um, or even the second or third ones to find out. I can speak more to that um, in a minute, but so that was that was part of it, it was just a coincidence that someone who knew us well gave us a ring, and we were able to go down uh, to the site right away and, and make our presence known. And I think you're right that uh, that is a role of the Watershed Association. I don't know that the river would have been considered as strongly as it was um, since we were there to advocate for the cleanup of the river and consideration of that, not just the, the street area. Uh, we heard from some paddlers who happened to be out uh, on the river at that time, too, that they were at a pipe that, you know, was connected to a, a storm drain, and it was just, like, gushing out. The oil was just gushing into the river. So that was good to get some firsthand accounts as well. Um, and then we played a role in putting together a community meeting a few weeks later to discuss, well, actually it was that same week, um, maybe five days later, that to talk about what had happened and what the ramifications of that were and what the cleanup would look like. 
so we have been in touch. It was um, J.P. Noonan Company, and we have certainly kept in touch with them about what's going on. And actually, they're just are coming out with um, some grants that are associated with the fees from the cleanup. So we'll hopefully be having some projects to to restore the mystic in that section uh, as a result of that. Um, but I can speak to last earlier this year there was a spill in the lower mystic. Trying to think of what it was, something odd. I think it's avoiding me. Okay. It was something that you would think would sink, but it floated. And it's because it was in a liquid state. Anyhow, I can't remember what it was, but that we found out like days later. So. We still have these communication struggles of, you know, we wanted to be alerted right away from the state and everything, and we weren't really that involved with that cleanup. And part of that is it was at a, a highly regulated industrial facility. So I didn't mention like what companies are along the Mystic River, but you know, there's Exxon Mobil has their largest pipeline terminal on the East Coast, um, Schnitzer Steel, Steel, which is a huge manufacturing company, uh, is there. So. Big companies that are really highly regulated, and, and there's some security issues with that too. It's a des designated port area, so we don't have access to the shoreline there. Um, in this particular spill, they wouldn't let us near it, which I understand, but if we wish we were in that case notified a little earlier so we could have at least reported it out. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure, <laughs> uh, and I wish I could answer that because that's you know my role is to kind of get the get the word out. I think a lot of it is word of mouth, but then we use all the the sort of normal channels of social media, our website, our you know we have a listserv that I send monthly e-newsletters to, who um, post things around campus and around town, uh, put it in the newspaper, press releases, that sort of thing. So, but I think a lot of it is word of mouth, especially as an example like the herring program. It's a lot of families that kind of know each other that come to do this with their kids as an example. And some of those 1,200 are probably people that have come back, but we don't bother calculating that because it would just be difficult, but we have people that volunteer for several programs and are pretty deeply involved with us, so, yeah. I'm wondering um, what you do when you track volunteer hours, like are you trying to decrease the number of volunteer hours mm -hmm. or make it more efficient, like you calculate bucket group per hour, <laughs> like how do you do that information? Yeah, we do, for that particular program, the Water Chestnut program, we do set goals a lot of times for the groups. And it's based on the past success of other groups of a similar size. And for us, it's just sort of interesting just so we can gauge where the next group should go. It might be a slightly different location in the river if we say, okay, this group has 10 people. I think they're only going to get this little patch of water chestnut, but this other group's coming with 50, so maybe we need to leave this patch for them, that sort of thing. So we do, it helps us in our planning for sure. Yeah. But otherwise, it's just fun to have the, the metrics. And I don't, know yet what we're going to really do with that, but it's good for ourselves to know, and it's good to, when we apply for grants to be able to say we have X number of volunteers, X number of hours of in-kind labor, essentially, which is um, really helpful to be able to, to quote that. Yeah. Hmm. We're still learning about that. Uh, I will say that the section year the Medford Whole Foods, we hit for three years in a row, and we noticed a difference this year. Prior to this year, I'll be honest, I was skeptical of the success of this program. Like, one, is great outreach. Yes, that's very true. But is it successful at actually removing this invasive plant? I wasn't sure about that, because it just is so prolific. And as I mentioned, the seeds are just crazy, and we'll keep coming back to get you. Um, but this year, I, I was assured, I was like, okay, this is, this is worth it. It's a lot of time, it's a lot of our energy, it's a lot of money, 
Um, but we are starting to see the success of several years of work, and I think that's what, what it takes. This isn't um, a plant that's unique to the Mystic other, uh, other uh, as well. <laughs> it's in the Charles. It's sort of throughout New England. So there's been other studies that indicate that you just have to stick with it year after year after year. Um, as an extraordinary case, we have this one volunteer who's just he's in love with rivers, and he volunteers for several rivers, uh, watershed associations in Massachusetts, but he took it upon himself to remove water chestnut from a uh, little pond in Alewife Brook area, and he went out there for like 10 years, and it's gone. And he goes back by himself, and just, he goes out with his kayak, Roger Freimer, I don't know if you know him, but he's one of a kind. He puts in a lot of hours for us doing that sort of work. So there are those dedicated people that really relate to their little section of river, and that's theirs, and they kind of take it as their own and manage it. So, yeah. Thank you, Jen, so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for that.